What's up, Big Sense? Hey, eh? how are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. good to we're gonna. You. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, we're gonna give it a minute. Let uh, some yeah. of the people on. Uh, I realize we might be stepping on Kyle. I just like I, looked I, at the time. Yeah, I just realized that too. Um, but we're gonna we'll record it and we'll put that out there too, so they have that. Yeah, we'll put and, both. Uh, will be both will be put out. I think both will be put out. Everyone will be happy. Yeah, you can't, um, you know, you can't beat that. So yeah, we'll give it a minute to uh, some people to join in and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I, my, my Although, uh, very, very aggressive bedtime can get in the way of things. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will say you took away one of my one of my questions automatically. I was going to ask about the mustache. Because uh, it's it's it, it, it had been in there and I was like, oh, I'm going to ask about the mustache tonight. And now the mustache is we gone. We can talk so I about, ask I, about it. I, I, it was it was very novel to both grow and have a mustache, but it gets in your mouth a little bit. For real, <laughs> especially if you don't have a barber to like fix that bottom lip part out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mess, and then over here it was a little too much. Yeah, the whole thing was a mess. Yeah, no, I, I I've done it before, and like, luckily I have my own trimmer, so I can like get the lip pieces. But yeah, that's kind of annoying. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it, you know, it lasted longer than some things. <laughs> listen, I, listen, you were, you were, you were right up there with Sebi in, in your, uh, <laughs> in, in going for the mustache competition. Yeah, he's, um, he's a mustache champion though. He's, he's got, he's, he, he can, he can keep it, he can grow it. Yeah, like, he's, like, uh, and, and he, and he grows it and it's like there in like two seconds. Like he walks out the gym one day and he comes back with a full <laughs> fucking mustache very uh very talented guy very talented guy anyway uh we've got some people joining in uh we've got a slew cool. of questions from the from the audience uh so with that being said i am gonna jump right in josh welcome back to the half guard half hour you are my first returning guest thank you uh for coming back on thanks thanks for having me i had a good time and um i thought it was a good way to connect you know i think people like it and uh, we can kind of talk to people. So yeah, I think so far, positive. so far, you have the most views on my YouTube channel. So, um, you know, well, I think that's, that's uh, going well. That's flattering. I'm glad people are into it. <laughs> A lot of people are into it. Uh, got it posted up on RBJJ. But with that being said, I'm going to jump right in. I, I with the last time, guys, if you missed the first episode, you know, I'm going to spare us all the beginning crazy questions that I asked last time. Click the link in my bio for that. Or if you're on the clockwork email, Josh shared that out in the last email. Um, with that being said, Josh, I wanted to kind of jump right back in uh, and bring up something and talk to you about something that I find super endearing about you as a gym owner and super just in general. I, it, it's such an amazing practice. Um, names right? To me, I think, and you and I have had this conversation in the past, and I talked to a lot of people about this outside of the gym. One of the things that has always stood out to me is, is that whether that person's coming in for a trial or you never, and you never really see them again, or they, they've come in six months earlier and they come back to sign up, you remember that person's name. Um, what about that process of remembering names or, or talking to people with their names is, is important to you? And why is it a, a best practice of yours? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a really nice way to let someone know you care, you know, and that you remember, especially, especially in New York, right? Like we're around all these people all the time and, you know, when someone remembers my name, whether it's like a dentist, um, someone at a coffee shop, uh, someone I only met once through a friend, I'm like, oh, wow, that, that felt really nice, you know, and to be able to kind of pay that forward, I think is important. And it, it's a lot of it just has to do with paying attention, because I'm, I'm not great at that in every aspect of life, you know, <laughs> but I, I make a real point to to care. Um, Whenever, whenever we're at clockwork, wherever we're at the gym. Cool. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I've always admired that, that facet uh, of, of you and, uh, and uh, of clockwork, because I think, 
you know, that is to, to a lot of people a, a very wow factor that, you know, the, the head instructor or just anybody in general can remember their name. Um, so with that being said, talk to me about how you structure the, I, and I know maybe I asked this before, but how do you, how do you structure your program to accommodate different body styles, different, different athleticism, like uh, athletic levels? And how do you, you know, tailor your style and your teaching to somebody who's five foot four, a hundred pounds versus big Charles, right? So how do you, how do you tailor the program for people in that way? Sure. I, I try and think about jujitsu and teach jujitsu in a way that's, that's not super attribute based, you know, in a way that kind of allows for, like you said, like someone who's five foot four, someone who's six foot four to be able to do the same technique. And I think that comes down to just a deep understanding of fundamentals and body movement. And that's what I focus on a lot, whether it's creating the white belt curriculum, um, stuff we're doing in some of the other classes or just we, you know, like in the advanced class, we have kind of a, uh, kind of a quick warm up there. Like I want to be doing things that everyone can do and that everyone should be able to do. But I think the, the key thread is that it's all very technical. And one thing Kyle and I have been talking a lot about when we're doing these moves of the week video is the idea that the, you have to move your body, right? It's not about it's not about reaching, right? It's about right. moving everything there and then grabbing it, um, or or the opposite, pulling away to create space. Um, so so I think it's more about body mechanics and fundamentals, and then using your personal attributes, whether they be athletic or physical, um, as a way to modify and enhance those techniques, right? So if you're super fast, super strong really tall, whatever, you, you find a way to, to make it work. Uh, okay. Better. So how, you know, and I've always been curious about this, how far in advance are you, because I know you're a planner, I know you have a whiteboard, how far in advance are you planning your curriculum out for the year, the month, like how, how far out are we when you're, when you're thinking about what you're going to teach? Sure. So for the white belt and the blue belt, programs those are on rotating curriculums so each one goes through about i think the the white belt goes through twice a year and the blue belt goes through a little less than one than twice a year so those are on a loop essentially and i i review those every christmas break it's one of the things i try and do is go through like look at some of the video be like oh maybe we could change that maybe keep that the same and then with the mixed class, I, I lay out the concepts or the like, okay, we'll be working on half guard this month, then open guard, then mount, then back, blah, blah, blah. So I do all that at the beginning of the year and it's all set up. And then I kind of fill in the techniques like quarterly. So there's a nice flow to it. Sometimes there's a big change in jujitsu or there's a new technique uh, that people are excited about. And I'll try and implement that to the extent it kind of makes sense. Awesome. Um, and, you know, when you're when you're planning these things out, or you're you're talking to um, your other coaches in the gym, are, are they are, are they giving input on on what you're going to be teaching? Or is that something solely you do on your own? Um, I, I just do it on my own, you know, and then one thing I try and do is always review with the teachers, whether it be like through sending them video, or sitting down and like making sure they understand like the ideas behind the techniques. And what's nice is as long as we're all on the same page with the concepts um, and, and I guess, and also key details, then each instructor can kind of add their own flavor and I, I'm, or spin to the technique. I'm sure you've seen that um, with your, you know, as you, as you train in these different classes at clockwork, you're like, Oh, Josh teaches that a little differently than so-and-so. And, -so. and they teach it differently than this other person. But the idea is that we're all focusing on the same kind of, uh, I'd, I'd say like core fundamentals of, of each technique. Cool. Um, and, you know, I've been with you for eight years uh, since I think I joined right as you guys just got to 650 Broadway. 
Um, and when I first joined, there was only white belt, there was a fundamentals class, and then there was mixed class. That was like it kind of on the same rotation that you have it now, like laid out hours, 7 a.m., et cetera. Um, what made you change or, or what made you think about adding the classes that we have now, the blue belt class uh, and, and the advanced class? Well, I, th I think one of the main things that I have to do is like a, both a head instructor and as the school owner is kind of cater to you guys and what you, what you want. Um, I know you're someone who's pretty religiously there for the advanced class, right? And you want to be there because you want to train hard for an hour once or twice a week, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the, so that answers that kind of question is there's some people that just want to go for it. And then I think the blue belt class kind of filled this gap, right? So people would take this white belt class, they take it, they take it, they take it. And maybe they only took the white belt class. And then they got, you know, they got to the point where they were ready for their blue belt. And then it was like a big jump to go to the mixed class. So the idea of kind of filling that hole, right? It's like, oh, so, so I'm always looking like, okay, where's a hole? Where's an opening? Um, and then an another reason that like, we started even just with the idea of like the six o'clock hour uh, for classes is that I always try and look at like where the the most stressed classes in terms of attendance. Like if there's a class that has like 50 people in it and that happened right before the shutdown a couple times, I'm like, Whoa, we got to figure this out. Like that's, that's a pretty big <laughs> class. You yeah. Know? That's especially for our, our facility and the way we like to space things out and have people have a little bit of uh, you know, have their own space to train and feel comfortable. So I'm always looking for ways to kind of take the stress off of off of these stressed classes and up until up and you know up until we shut down that was looking like okay we got to figure out something at the five o'clock hour maybe to pull off a little bit of the six o'clock class um and, and i'm just con constantly looking to to make it a better experience for everyone and to make the classes more accessible to everyone who's there i think the white belt class is a really good class for people that are just getting started but then, you know, as people move up and they get better, then they kind of have different needs in terms of programming. So you kind of started to hint a little bit at, you know, looking at the hours and the stress of the class. Um, anything you, you care to reveal, any, any tips or, or, or secrets you care to reveal about reopening, about maybe adding something into the schedule that's not already there? Or, or maybe adding into a new class, um, or, or just any, anything like any, any goss. You got any goss? <laughs> any goss? <laughs> you know, what, what I would love to do is just be able to do jujitsu again. You know, <laughs> I'd like to be able to do jujitsu again in a way that's like safe for everybody. Um, I'd like to do jujitsu in a way that you know allows clockwork to keep doing what we're doing, trying to have like a positive impact on people's lives, and. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I don't, I don't really think we're going to go back and start adding classes. I, I, and if we do, it'll be probably based on the idea that the state or the city has put a ceiling on how many people can be in a space at a given time. So those are, I mean, to be transparent, these are, these are things I'm thinking about all the time. And I'm working on decks and looking at what other schools are doing in terms of planning. Um, it's kind of a heavy, you know, it's kind of a heavy thing to talk about, but I, think, yeah. I, I don't think New York's in an ideal position for reopening <laughs> anything right now. Yeah. I, and certainly not first, you know, I, we're sure. I, I don't know. I, that'd be really surprising to me. Yeah, no, um, for sure. Um, so the next topic, topic. I, yeah, no, I think it's a, definitely an interesting topic. The next topic I actually wanted to discuss was something I kind of started to bring up with Kyle uh, and talk to him about during his show, uh, promotions. You know, I think everybody likes to hear a little bit about the process. So can you, when you guys, you yourself, you know, Kyle said, hey, we kind of get together, me, Sev, and Josh, kind of like a little bit of a collective vote. Josh ultimately at the end of the day has final say in yes or no. So when you personally are, you know, sitting, looking through the roster, making those decisions on that next belt for that person, 
what are some of the criteria that you're looking at? Because, and, and this is just a personal opinion. Uh, I, I, I think I noticed that the minute the email goes out that promotions are coming up, it turns into a bit of a shark tank. People start showing up in droves and, and they spend that last two weeks or that month trying to kill each other. And I'm under the impression that I think these decisions are pretty much made up by that point. Um, so can you talk to us through that and, and tell us what that process looks like for you when you're making those decisions? Sure. So one of the things that changed and actually made it a lot easier for us to do promotions is the idea that the IBJJF came out with these kind of mandatory minimums for lengths that people stay at a belt, right? So, you know, we have software, I use a spreadsheet, and I look at everyone who's been that belt, who's been at their belt long enough to even get promoted. And then we look and we like to see, you know, one of the biggest things I think for getting better at jiu-jitsu and then also for getting the most out of the experience is you gotta you gotta go you gotta go to class right so so that's a factor and then you gotta show improvement and i guess that's where it gets a little more um subjective right like we we have a discussion where like who who everyone kind of gets to nominate people they're like yeah i think this guy's ready that guy's ready and uh and then we look at we're like oh well she she's been training long enough she's way better than she used to she's a she's a real asset to the community and uh that person's right and maybe someone else's name gets brought up and they're like oh you know i think they benefit from a little more time at the belt so they can get a little more comfortable and when they go to the next belt they're ready and i think one of the big considerations is i mean you know you you were a white belt and then you're a blue belt and a pearl belt and a brown belt it, it's it's an honor, right, to get promoted, especially in the moment. And it feels great. And when people ask you what belt you are, you get to say, I'm a brown belt. I train at clockwork. I train with Josh for this long. But outside of that, it's just a responsibility. <laughs> you know, you got you to gotta go out there. People are going to come at you harder every single time. And what we want to do is, is make sure people are in a position to kind of uphold the standards, you know, and that's it. And I love everybody. It's never, it's never a personal, <laughs> it's never a personal thing to the extent like, oh, I don't like that guy, so I don't want him to get that belt. No, it's more like, oh, I think they benefit from more time and experience, and they'll be better positioned to take on that responsibility. Cool. And the, the other, the other side of that coin is, is, you know, I think some people are afraid to, you know, maybe they don't, they don't get the belt right on promotions sure. night. Uh, and either they're feeling down on themselves or maybe they're just not, you know, they're like, damn, I should have gotten it. I didn't get it. I think one of the big things that comes out of that uh, is a, maybe a certain fear of being able to come up to you and say, hey, what do I have to do? Right. Yeah. What are your thoughts and opinions on somebody coming up to you? Uh, maybe not right after the promotion within days. Of, and, and just asking you questions about what they need to improve on to get to that next level. Yeah. Um, I'm probably a little more old school about it in the, in the sense that I, I think kind of being like, oh, how can I become a brown belt? How can I become a purple belt? How can I do that? I think that's the wrong approach. Like what, what I would say is like, hey, how can I get better at jiu-jitsu? Is there anything in my game you see that's like a big hole? And I, I think you're, you're a great example of a guy who started filling holes in his game, right? And every time you started filling a hole in your game, you got better at jiu-jitsu. And you're a brown belt because you're better at jiu-jitsu. You're not a brown belt because you did this and this and this and this, right? You're, you're a brown belt because you put in a ton of time. You put in a ton of effort. And the belt follows that. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, no, a hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's a slight distinction, but, but it's a, it's a pretty important one in terms of like motiv motivation, you know, like if, if you're trying to get better every day, you can control that. If you're trying Fair to enough. get your, yeah. If you're trying to get your belt, like 
it's there's no tough, man. There's no check. Not for me. I think like the, the the only person I really compare people to is themselves. You know, I'm like, oh, where you know that guy showed up and he was super strong and already a pain in the ass, and now he's a little bit better. Maybe that guy's not ready. But then you have another person who's like never played sports, was never particularly uh, physical, and they kind of become physical through jujitsu. They learn the techniques. They get better. That's an easier decision for me. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I've always been curious. Have you ever thought, you know, Henzo has affiliates. Mansara has affiliates. Sure. You know, that, 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 that game. Have you ever thought about going that avenue, you know, taking Seb and, and saying, here, go to the Bronx and open Go to Kentucky. Go to, yeah, I don't think he, I don't know if he'd survive in Kentucky. Uh, he could, he could be the governor of Kentucky in like four years. You know, we don't know. We never know. I, I believe not in, in this Seb. crazy world. Um, um, yeah. So, so what I think is, um, that's actually something I've been talking with uh, some of the guys about. So obviously we have like an affiliate, a loose affiliation right? Like, like you teach at, at Gavin's gym and Bree teaches there and Sandy teaches there. Adam and Karen teach in New Jersey. And, and I have um, a lot of black belts that are teaching at other, they have their own schools. And one of the things that I would love to do is kind of formalize that. And then to the extent we want to go to tournaments as a team, we can pull our points. And that, I mean, that's the kind of the big secret to winning team tournaments, right? Is you have a ton of people show up and they're usually from different schools um the other aspect of it is to start setting up team trainings that's something i would love to do is to have a, an outlet where you know it's kind of like our advanced class but maybe we're doing it once a month and we you know hopefully we can do it at a centralized locations like like if we, we have people in new jersey we have people in long island brooklyn like all, all over the place so I think where we train makes the most sense, but I'd be, I'd be open to traveling. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, our, our space is definitely um, big enough, <laughs> even That's, though we could yeah. be bigger at yeah. this point, 50 more yeah. people on the mat. Yeah. Wow. I'd, I'd love that. <laughs> um, I'd love that. So I'm going to jump into some of the fan questions because <laughs> fans. I got fans, Josh followers uh, of my podcast, Students of Clockwork Jiu Jitsu. Uh, there, I, I got about twenty questions, uh, so I had to like get them down. Guys, if you have any questions after I ask these, drop them in the comments box. Uh, but maybe some of these. There were a few from Dan Lustig that I cannot ask. That's fair. Um, Michael Constantino wants to know uh, about you being forty years old and collecting Social Security. I, How's I, that uh... feel? It's great. It's really taking a lot of the financial stress off my family in these uncertain times. <laughs> um, I had to, I had to ask that one because that was the best of all of his questions. Um, uh, I will actually start with Big Charles. Uh, that's a very good question for Josh. Will you ever compete again? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's definitely something I enjoyed at one point in my life. Uh, I think my life's a little more complicated than it used to be. Um, but if, yeah, if the, if the right opportunity presented itself, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Sweet. Uh, I'm not going to name names on all these questions because I wrote them down, but one of the big ones that ha has come up a couple times from several people, why no music at Clockwork? Why no music? I think it can be a little dangerous. We have some, some verbal tappers out there and uh, you can't always hear when they tap. But the bigger reason is a per it's, it's very personal reason is I used to train at a gym and they played the worst music and I hated it. So I have a tremendous amount of empathy for people that don't like the music. So if you, you like your favorite song, somebody hates it. <laughs> My what? favorite song, somebody hates it. And I, I, I kind of like, I like the vibe a little bit for uh, no music, but I, I, I had been considering uh reggae fridays we'll see if reggae that, if fridays that you're kind reggae of a jerk fridays. if you don't like reggae i think <laughs> you are kind of a jerk <laughs> if you don't like reggae. um so josh with that being said uh what are your current thoughts on the state of lapel guard i.e the worm guard all of those different lapel guards that are are, are starting to emerge 
uh, in the current generation of jujitsu players? Sure. Um, I, I think it's, I think if you view jujitsu through, through the lens that it's like, it's a technology, right? Um, then it only makes sense that that technology is going to continue to improve. And the, the main tool we have is the, the lapels, right? The gi. So I, I think it's very natural that people are going to find ways to use them that are inventive and, and effective. I do think you, you have to understand your fundamentals, you know? So if you, and it, to me, it's not very different than like the, the Barambolo. I mean, you started jujitsu as Barambolo kind of grew into like yeah. a staple, right? So there's guys who focused on that in, in lieu of like understanding how to pass the half guard instead of like understanding how to play close guard. And I think it's fine. And like eventually you'll fill those holes, but I don't think it's like a substitute for understanding like uh, more fundamentals. Uh, but it's it works. The stuff works. It's real, you know. <laughs> it is real. Um, next one uh, from the audience: best way to improve cardio for jujitsu. Best way to improve cardio for jujitsu. I think the best way to improve cardio for jujitsu is to do um, pretty high volume training. So just do a lot of rounds. The more rounds you do in jujitsu, the better you're going to feel and you, the better you're going to get comfortable. I think there's also a big uh, misconception. Um, well, the, the best way to be to have a lot of gas, like a big gas tank when you do jujitsu, is to do the um, is to get good at jujitsu, be efficient in your energy, right? But the other part of it is uh, the best shape I've ever been in in my life is when I did jujitsu, I was doing yoga, and then I also had uh, some sort of strength and conditioning. The two things that I think are the best are uh, the rowing machine. If you can get access to a concept two rowing machine, doing sprint interval sprints on there. And then also like uh, on the jump rope, like the heavy jump ropes. I think those, those are really good. Awesome. Yeah, no, agreed. I, 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 I can't agree with you. The more rounds you do, the better your cardio is going to be. And, um, that gas tank definitely does go a long way. Um, somebody asked, what's your favorite vegan dish? My favorite vegan dish? Um, I, I like to make dal. I started cooking that a while ago. And now, since we've been in quarantine, I'm making it once, once a week, sometimes twice a week. It's like lentils, brown rice, ginger, turmeric. It's, it's really good. Uh, guys, again, don't forget to ask your questions in the chat box below as I go through my questions here with Josh. Um, McManus, MK, uh, Big Dog MK, asks, what are the origins of the name Clockwork? Origins of the name Clockwork. Great question. So first part of it is that I think Clockwork sounds cool. I don't – I can't say that about every uh, – name I've heard of for a jiu-jitsu school, especially when I started jiu-jitsu. Now there's a lot of great names, but it used to just be a guy's name and then like dojo afterwards or academy. Uh, so I think it's, it's kind of, it was different at the time to, to name it after something else. And then the clock, uh, it's a metaphor, right? So you look at a clock and it appears to do something very simple, right? You have the time just going around and around. But if you're to open the back of the clock, you're going to see all these gears, levers, springs, and that's what makes it work. And I, I find the more I do jujitsu, the simpler things look, the more accurate you have to be with them, and the more complicated they are on the back end. So I like that as a metaphor. Awesome. Uh, I have a question that just comes to mind. Um, in your jujitsu journey, your personal yes. journey from white belt to, to, to uh, black belt, was there ever anybody out there from either a competition level or a personal level that you wished you could have uh, rolled with that you haven't yet? That I haven't yet? Yeah. Um, yeah, Hickson. Hickson Gracie, man. He's, he's legendary. 
you know, find out, find out what it's all about. And uh, I, I think he's, he did so much for the sport, both in terms of like um, growing the sport, but also in ter terms of like creating a mystique, right? <laughs> like he's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing, amazing dude. I've gotten to train with or compete with a lot of the, the guys that I've studied and that's been amazing and super cool. So, but Hickson. So who do you feel you, 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 you've learned the most from in your, uh, and maybe you might not want to name names, but who do you feel you've learned the most from in your jujitsu journey from white to black belt? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I'd say like there's one person I learned the most from because I, I think, I think it's, that's, that's really hard to say. What I would say, <laughs> what I, what I would say is, you can learn so much by watching how other people do jujitsu and what you want to do is, is ask questions. So I think, I think like kind of a cop out answer, but like, it's not, it's not necessarily a person, it's a process. And right. it's the process of seeing somebody do something and then studying and then really understanding what they're doing. And you, you do that by studying more, by asking questions, trying and failing and I think it's less about a person and more about like creating and embodying like a learning process. So, awesome. yeah, I think that's the key. So how do you, uh, another question came through, how do you regulate your uh, training and not overtrain? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, for me, I, I kind of go by, by feel and then routine. And then I like to have usually like one class that's kind of variable. Like if by the end of the week I'm feeling tired, I skip, I don't train in that class. Right. Um, and if I'm feeling good, I will train in that class. So at the, at the point I was at before we, we went on our, our break here, I was trying to do four trainings a week and doing kettlebells three times a week and then doing yoga like six times a week. And then I would take that Saturday competition class, which, which is a tough class. Um, and I, I, if I was beat, I'd wake up Saturday morning tired, it wasn't happening, I'd bail on that class. And then another thing I, I would try and do, I, I try and do is if I am feeling tired, like, like do something that's a little more restorative, like whether it's like go to the sauna, take Epsom salt bath, try and take extra, get extra sleep. Um, those are things I kind of look at, but I like the idea of like having one class you'll bail on if you feel beat. Cool. Uh, big Charles asked, can intermediate and advanced players take any of the beginners classes to keep base, uh, to keep basics sharp? Dude, at this point, anyone wants to take any class, I'll have you. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get, you know, we got to get the thing, thing, thing open and, and then Charles can scare everyone in the white belt class. <laughs> um, I, I see a bunch of questions popped into the box that I actually already have on my list. So I'll go, what's your uh, go-to submission from your part, from your training partner or your opponent's back? Bone arrow, bone arrow choke. Very That's brutal it. choke. Yeah. Uh, and how do you incorporate a Shanga breathing techniques into your jujitsu training uh and how do you feel it's in th those techniques have improved your jujitsu game yeah I, th I think um the big the biggest improvement i got from yoga is that you just kind of understand how to use your body a little better and a little more efficiently and if you focus on your breathing in any capacity for half hour 90 minutes two hours a day you're, you're going to get better at it. Um, I'd already been doing jiu-jitsu super long time when I started, but I found the breathing really, especially the breathing through the nose all the time, really helps you kind of stay calm and it helps you stay efficient with your, both your breath and your, your lever, uh, energy exertion. 
Cool. What's the one, what is one thing you didn't anticipate about owning a school other than Corona? <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> I, just didn't, I just didn't see the panda. Everything else I had nailed. Um, I, I, I didn't know I'd be able to have so much impact on other people's lives by teaching jujitsu. And, and that's also probably the best thing about running a school and teaching is that I get to positively impact people's lives. I mean, through this whole thing, obviously, emotional time, a lot of uncertainty, and people reach out and they send a note and you get some really heartwarming notes and people let you know how you positively affected their life. And I didn't anticipate that. I thought I was just gonna teach arm bars and get to, get to, get to not have a real job. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I also like Ray's next question, which is, do mustaches make you better at jujitsu? Um, I never got to find out. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to save that one for another guest. So. Uh, I might, or, or we'll have to save that one for uh, part three when the school reopens. That would be great. Um, black and blue roll, is it happening again? It was scheduled for this year. I was talking to Hoya about it and then the concert's canceled. So, so it's canceled this year, but I'd, I'd love to do it next year. That's, that's, that's one of the, the things I really love to do. That's kind of how I got started with doing kind of charity stuff was we, we did that and we, we gave the money uh, to a guy, John Joseph was helping out, a kid John Joseph was helping out that had cancer. And that, that's another thing that I think is awesome is being able to help people in that way too. Awesome. So yeah, I mean, that brings me that brings up a question for me, because I, I see uh, you're posting and have helped out with Interfaith. And for those yeah. people watching that don't know what that is, uh, I actually got to witness it because uh, the Starbucks on St. Mark's opened and I saw them set up when I was there. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that? And then if anybody does uh, in the community wants to help out that lives in New York City, can you tell us how, how that all worked out? Sure. It was kind of serendipitous. I was, um, I saw my friend, John Joseph, uh, he posted a video of, of this guy, Adi. And he asked Adi, he's like, he kind of introed it. He's like, this guy's been feeding the homeless in Tompkins Square Park for 30 <laughs> years. And then he walked up to him and he said, yo, Adi, tell the people how long you've been feeding people here. And he goes, well, that doesn't matter. What matters is I did it today. And we're here today to help the people. And I thought that was like a really beautiful answer. So that's when I kind of, that's when I decided I wanted to do it. And I told a couple people, I told Bree, we were going to work with the guy. And I told some, some, some people that helped me do the merch where let's figure something out and help this guy in some way. And then I went home for Christmas. I came back and I, I ran into the guy and I was like, Hey, you're John Joseph's friend. He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, he goes, what's your name? And I said, oh, it's Josh. He said, Josh, when do you want to start volunteering with the food distribution? And I was like, wow, that's it's kind of kind of psychic, kind of direct. I don't know which one of the two it is, but either way, I ended up going in the next week, and we um, I, you just show up. They have a kitchen on Fifth Street, right next to the precinct. And they're, they say, why are you here? And you're like, oh, I'm here to help. And they're like, great, put on an apron. And you get some, you wash some dishes, you put some icing on a cake, maybe you stir some rice for a while, and then you take all the food to Tompkins Square Park and you, you help distribute it to people that are, you know, that are hungry. And it feels, it feels great. And I did a seminar um, at North South Jiu Jitsu and then we gave all the money to them and it felt really good. And it's a, it's a awesome way to give back and specifically to give back. I mean, that's where we, you know, you grew up right there, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I live a few blocks away. So to, to be able to give back in that way, I think is really important. And especially prior to this, it helps you. We're all just people, you know, and if we can help each other, I think we should. Yeah, no, guys, uh, follow Josh on Instagram. He tags them in a lot of posts. 
Um, and I can tell you they're still out there even in the time of COVID yeah. feeding people. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so other than family and yoga and jujitsu, what other things do you do to improve yourself daily? Uh, what else do I do? Um, I try and read a lot, try and listen to audiobooks. Uh, I, the, I try to play guitar. I'm not very good at guitar. And there's no extra time. That's it. I only have time for those <laughs> things. Every time I try and add something, it doesn't work. So, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, Ray asked, how do you handle periods when you believe your skill is plateauing or you're being stagnant? Yeah, well, I think, I I think sometimes like you'll get an outcome that's stagnant, right? Like you're not gonna get better, but the re the reality is every time you're in there, you're working towards improvement. But I don't think many jujitsu people would say they're you know their their improvements like a straight line, right? It's not linear improvement. It's either gonna be more like a sign where you're getting better, then a little bit worse, better or worse, or it will be more like plateaued up, right? So I think that's normal. You have to stick with it, whatever it is. If you're trying to get stronger, you keep lifting weights every, you know, whatever your program is. If you're trying to get better cardio, you keep doing that. And I, I think that's the key is you just stick with it and you understand that that's the nature of growth is it's not going to be linear. Um, so Jason asked, have you ever done any other martial arts? I did Kung Fu for three months in high school. And I did judo for a little bit. I did a little bit of judo on the, the 14th Street YMCA. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, and I assume, uh, I don't know who this might be, but would you ever move back to California? Would I ever move back to California? They, they, you know, they, they'd have to, you know, just say no more New York. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, my wife and I talk about this and, and like, we, yeah, it's, especially before Jasper, we're like, Oh, maybe one day we'll go back to California. But for me, especially once we had had uh, our kid, it was so clear that we have such an awesome community in New York. And it, it was probably really obvious before then, but having him and having all the people that that were started becoming involved in his life made it made it really awesome. So awesome. yeah, I, I think I think we're at a at a New York or nowhere kind of point in our life. But <laughs> who knows? I, I mean, I, I mean, West Coast weather happen. West Coast weather is nice. It's much better, um, but you know, we love New York. Uh, so does my wife. Uh, another California transplant. Um, more than teaching, what do you hope students walk away with after class? Or excuse me, uh, more than technique, what do you hope students walk away with after the class? I mean, I, I think one of the biggest things, and I was talking with Matt Johnson about this, is like, there, there's so much you can learn from jujitsu, you know, like you learn like, oh, I, I can get better at something that's hard by just showing up every day. You can learn persistence, you gain confidence um, beyond technique, you gain physical, um, physical health. And I, I, I think also like, like most of my best friends are from jujitsu. Like the the best relationships I have are through jujitsu. Even my, I met my wife because one of my friends said, "Oh yeah, that guy's a black belt in jujitsu." Like that was, <laughs> that's how, you know. So like, um, I I think it's the the kind of thing that the more you put into it, you know, like you you get so much in terms of like personal growth and then also community. I think the community aspect is something you, you always know is there and then little things happen and you're like, whoa, like promotion night is something for me. Like it's so moving for me to see like, oh, there's 130 people in this room. You know, I hope the fire marshal doesn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask three more questions. Ray, Rob Squires, I got you. One more in the box, and then I'm going to respect Josh's time and let him go because we've ran well over the half hour. Uh, so no we problem. might have to do a part. We might have to do a part three somewhere down the road. Okay. Um, so which instructors 
or instructor do you look up to in terms of the way they teach or how they convey their ideas? Um, that's a that's a really good question. One one of the guys I, I was studying a lot recently is Mikey Mushimeshi. Um, I, I think he's just he's a really smart dude, and he's obviously an amazing competitor. But he has a really interesting way of breaking down the techniques, but also viewing them through like a conceptual lens. So he's one of the guys like I, I study. Um, who else? Damian Maya. He put out some instructional stuff, and I I never uh, got to train with him, but I, I got to see all that stuff. That helped me a lot. Salo Hibero is another guy who who his instructionals helped me a lot. Kenny, obviously, he's helped me a lot with my jiu-jitsu, especially like the mindset. One of the things he, he told me that really stuck is it's it's not about learning jiu-jitsu, it's about learning how to learn jiu-jitsu, right? And it's that idea of like, oh, you stay stay kind of open and, and be ready to, to take on the new techniques with an open mind, and then, then they're more likely to sink in. I can go, also, I can go, I can go as long as you want. Sweet. I didn't, yeah. you know, uh, we, we can keep going as long as the questions keep coming. Um, cool. wh <laughs> what are some people, what, what are some of the people you look up to or who are the some of the uh, people you look up to Rob Squires asks? Maybe inside jujitsu. So we've been talking about jujitsu a lot. Who are some people outside of jujitsu that you look up to? Um, I, you know, I, I looked up to my parents a lot. Um, I think they did a, a great job with me and my sisters. I look up to my wife. She's really amazing. Um, she inspires me a lot. And I think one of the guys, you know, another guy is that guy I told you about. You, we, you brought him up from Interfaith. His name's Adi. Yeah. And he's a dude for, for 30 years, three days a week, he's fed the homeless in Tompkins Square Park. Like, you know, 30 years ago, that wasn't like the best the best block in the neighborhood, you know? So the fact that, that he's doing that or did that for so long, I think it's just a testament to like consistency and, and purpose. And I mean, he's doing it now. Like most people aren't leaving their house and he's out there being of service to other people. I think it's, I think that's super, super, super inspirational. Uh, those are some that come to mind. I, I don't I could, if I had a little more time, I could probably give you more. What's your, uh, uh, our, our, our old buddy Cam, who's out there on the West Coast, uh, asked, uh, what's been your, what do you feel has, up to this date has been your toughest competition match? My toughest competition match? I think it was, it was Hamilo Bahal. I fought Hamilo in Abu Dhabi at the Abu Dhabi World Pro. And it's just really good guard. He swept me and then so heavy on top. I didn't think he was going to be heavy like that on top. And uh, yeah, he was, he's the toughest guy I went against. He was amazing. Uh, how important do you think it is as an instructor to stay up on current, current competition meta? I, I think it's really important. Um, I think, I think what, what you have to do, especially with, with that is understand like that there's levels to it and the the idea is so few of your students are going to require that right like the majority of your students need to learn how to bridge right they need to learn how to do arm bars from the guard and i think i think it's important to stay up on it but i think it's probably more important to uh have a strong understanding of and ability to explain the fundamentals. Cool. Ray also asked, Ray is full of questions tonight. I think he <laughs> misses an, you. He's an inquisitive guy. We, we he, well, I miss him too. I, I think I might have to have Ray on the podcast. Ray, are you going to do my podcast? Um, Cause you got some good, you got some good stuff here. What's the best punk rock album? The best punk rock album. Um, oh man. Great question. My my favorite punk rock album is probably uh, Blitz, Voice of a Generation. That's a that's a album I listen to a lot. And then any of the Bad Brains, probably Band in DC by the Bad Brains. Yeah, 
that's that's making you make, making you think there um making me think yeah making you think so josh uh with that being said that's it buddy i think awesome. we're uh I think we, we, we filled almost an hour, which is amazing. So that definitely calls for a part three somewhere down the road. Uh, with that being said, um, I have one last question for you. Uh, if you can, do you have any updates on the status? I mean, obviously you don't because the governor hasn't said anything yet. Um, <laughs> Constantine. Um, made me lose my uh train of thought uh any any anything you want to share any any anything state of the union you'd like to address for the fans and the people out there watching my show and the students um what's the state of the union of clockwork because that's also another question that kind of keeps coming up people are afraid we're not going to be there yeah so so the 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 main thing i want to say is we're committed to doing everything we can to get people back into the space and start being in the space again. Uh, to, to the extent, obviously we're gonna follow whatever the city and state guidelines are. And I, that could mean we start with, I, I worked on a reopening contingency plan for the last couple of days. And one aspect of that might be we're doing non-contact movement classes or yoga classes or kettlebell classes inside the space right another thing is we'll, we'll probably have to cap attendance so people sign up before class um and then just thinking about safety concerns with all that stuff so there's the, the challenging part for me is that there's so much unknown like we we don't know like a, lo a lot of people are like oh what if everybody gets these antibody tests and we, i think that's great like it's more information, um, but we really don't know what that means. Um, does that mean you can train safely with other people that have had that? I don't know. And I, I think that the big thing is like focusing on what we can control. I think one thing we can control is we keep the space as clean as possible. Next thing we can control is, you know, like this, the social distancing aspect. So we, fo we focus on that stuff. And we, we try to make the space as safe as we can. Um, we make sure that clockwork can still be there. And we make sure that everyone understands, you know, it's kind of like an ongoing theme is that like your, your actions will affect not just this like greater sense of like the curve, right? And, and how many people end up in the hospital, but to a lesser extent, like your immediate clockwork community, you know? so. I wouldn't really want people training at other schools or at a lot of places, you know, it's like, there's, there's just more risk. So the extent that we can kind of mitigate risk, that's what I want to do. And I want to make it as safe as I can for people to come back and do jujitsu. I, I think we're lucky in the sense that jujitsu people would probably, we could probably fill the room tonight. <laughs> if we, if we open the thing up, we probably could. <laughs> Um, I, I don't, I, I think it's probably better for us to wait. Um, but yeah, I want to get us as open as soon as we can, as safe as we can. And if it's not, if it's not like a rolling the way it used to be, everybody trains with everybody jiu jujitsu class, at least in some capacity where we're all in the space, there's a sense of community, we're exercising and we're, we're having a fun kind of positive experience. Um, I want to do that as soon as we can. And if, awesome. you know, and to the extent that people want to do uh, virtual classes or something like that, I'm open to that. Um, and and I, I would love for direct feedback. You can hit me up on here or email if that's something you're interested in and we can figure out how to get that going. Um, but yeah, I want to keep everybody happy and I want to keep everybody safe and I want to get back to as close as we can to where we were. Awesome. Josh, uh, thank you so much. Is there anything you want to plug that you haven't already plugged? Anything you'd like to uh, discuss or talk about that maybe I missed? Um, yeah, check out the, the stuff, the projects we did with Mark Harrington at clockwork.myc. If you didn't do that yet, it's, it's great stuff. Mike got some, some of the stuff. Um, uh, my wife's wearing it right now in the house. And, uh, and then I want to thank uh, Show Your Roll. They've always, you know, they supported me for a long time. They're awesome.
And I want to thank all you guys. You know, I want to thank the students, especially the ones that are able to support right now. And I want to keep it going. Oh, yeah, man. Walking. <laughs> I'm walking. I'm walking. I got my, uh, I got my, uh, my, my shirt. There you go, dude. If you, if you guys have not seen it, you should go check it out. Like Josh said. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it was a good project. It made me happy. It, yeah, no, amazing, amazing, uh, amazing project. I love it. Uh, Mark is going to be on here at some point. Uh, yeah. to talk about the project because I think that's great stuff. Uh, but with that being said, Josh, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, thank everybody for tuning in. Guys, this coming Friday at 1 p.m., special edition with uh, ADCC champ JT Torres. Um, check it out at 1 o'clock this coming Friday, Eastern time, guys. Yeah. I uh, just want to say miss everybody. Thanks so much for checking it out. And uh, to tell JT I said what's up. <laughs> I will. Thanks, Josh. All right. Cheers, guys. Be Bye. good.